Thank you very much for the introduction, Paula, and for the invitation to be here. Um, and uh, basically, we want to talk to you a bit about uh, a pilot project that we've been working on. We will be kind of s settling you into that and giving you some sense of the substance of it. But please be assured that we, you know, we're very aware this is a methods talk. We're, we're primarily focusing on the methods. So if your background isn't in HIV um, in particular uh, as, a, as an area of health research, fear not. Uh, we'll try not to to bamboozle you with loads of HIV acronyms, which we tend to like to do. Um, so basically, uh, we're working as a part of a network of qualitative HIV social researchers in the UK. You can probably tell from my accent, I'm from here originally, but I've been over there for uh, 20 years. Uh, and I'm based at the University of Glasgow. Uh, Peter Keogh and I have worked together for a goodly part of that 20 years. Um, and he's now at uh, the Open University. Uh, so, uh, I'll, I'll, we'll be acknowledging that network of social researchers on the final slide. We were working to gain insights into some of the remarkable changes that have come about within HIV that relate to the antiretroviral treatments that were introduced in 1996. Um, most people will be relatively familiar with that kind of shift change that occurs um, at that time. Um, and and we, we were looking at across that period now within the context of claims that it's going to be possible to end AIDS by 2030. And that's a claim that's often made but is also contested and contestable. Um, so the research questions that brought us to this work relate to the meanings and the impacts generated by this continuous repurposing of HIV treatments that have gone on through that period and what that might look like in terms of the, con the futures that those treatments are constructing for the people that are being instructed instructed to take them. So our talk today focuses on how and why we decided to reuse um, qualitative data in this endeavor, in this look back. Um, and we will offer some detail, as I said, on the content of the project, but we're really going to mostly stock, um, stick to the, the methods and some of the practicalities and the sticky bits as well. Um, so in terms of the structure for today, um, I'm going to hand over to Peter in a moment, so he'll give you a bit of an intro introduction and a bit of the history and the creations of the, the production of what is being called secondary data analysis. Um, then we're actually going to stop and have a short discussion between you all. We thought we might have 10 people in the room. Um, so I'm rejigging how I th I'm thinking of doing that. And, um, and uh, then I'll go, uh, I'll be discussing a sort of in a slightly longer segment, um, our project. Uh, what took us to it, what some of our driving questions were, and then the practica practical issues of how we've done some of what we've done. And then we should have, we're planning on a good half hour long discussion at the end. So we're, we're just going to, th there'll be some chopping and changing. So to kind of introduce secondary data analysis itself, I've put up an image here of archaeologists working, uh, digging in a field, m maybe, you know, having to be um, cautious about what they're doing so as not to disturb the ground in which they're working but also never quite being sure what might come up next. Um, and lots of people use lots of metaphor uh, but this is, this is just one option. Um, Secondary data analysis is sometimes referred to as qualitative secondary analysis. We're f focusing just on quali analysis of qualitative data here. Sometimes the acronym QSA is something that you'll come across. Um, and more and more now, it's being referred to as data reuse. Um, so when we are talking about this concept, what we're referring to is the reuse of qualitative data for purposes other than or temporarily removed from and I think that's an, an important distinction um, from its original collection. So it's not necessarily about pursuing different questions. It might be about happening at a delayed time. Throughout the remainder of our talk, Peter and I will mostly be referring to data reuse um, for reasons that should become a little bit more clear as we go along. So I just wanted to check by show of hands. Has it, have any of you been involved in reusing qualitative data, either of your own or of others? for another purpose or the same purpose. Higher, please. So a few. That's really helpful. Thank you. Because I've, um, I've given a much different talk, version of this talk before, and no one had. Um, so it's very interesting that we do have some experience of that, and that, that will come into the discussion for sure. Was there anything that anyone wanted to say about that before we move on? Any comments or 
things that you're bringing into the room about this, yeah? I just cannot imagine doing it in someone else's data. Okay, but had you done it on your own? After having done it on my own. Okay, okay, so that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Definitely going to be a discussion point, so <laughs> thank you for that one. Okay, so I'll hand over to Peter then. Okay, so as, as Catherine said, there, um, and, and, and certainly in terms of our introduction and in your own experience, uh, there's definitely been, uh, should we call, a little kind of uh, some disagreements or some tensions, to say the least, about uh, secondary qualitative analysis or da qualitative data reuse. Um, and what I want to talk a bit about now is the, these tensions and where, where they, certainly in the UK context, where they emanate from in terms of you know, disciplinary, methodological, epistemological, and ethical considerations or problems, um, or as I said, tensions with um, the reuse of qualitative data. Um, certainly in the UK and in Europe, um, we, you know, the debaters tend to polarize between those who are very much in favor of the reuse of qualitative data for a range of reasons, and those who are much more skeptical about this. And the skepticism, I think, um, centers around questions about the, the status of pre-existing qualitative data. And, and, and to my mind, it really, a lot of it comes down to this, which is although we can archive transcripts and recordings, um, what is the data, what is the status of these data when they're detached from the context and the reflexive processes of the original researcher? which almost by definition can't be archived. And no matter how many checks and balances we put in place about the contextual stuff around the study, we really cannot archive the mind, the sense-making of the original researcher who was doing this work. So lots of questions emerge. Is it possible to generate entirely new and robust findings from an analysis of decontextualized or depersonalized data? What's the nature of the encounter between the, the new researcher, the secondary analyst, and this data? And what's being analyzed here? Is it the data itself? Or is it the meaning making of the original researcher? And where is the original researcher implicated in this process, in this new encounter between the new researcher and the data, and his data? And obviously, how can we ensure informed consent from either the participants or indeed from the original researcher for the uses to which this data may be put in a very undefined, unclear future? And certainly in our experience from quantitative reanalysis, we've learned a lot of very salutary lessons over the years in the area of HIV about the way in which our data has been used post hoc. Now, as a research team, we found ourselves having to grapple with these questions in ways that we actually didn't expect when we set out. Um, we were like basically a, a bunch of Egypts coming to this, I think, <laughs> new. We thought, we'll just get our data sets and have a look at them and reanalyze them. But of course, as soon as we started digging, we realized that this was a very fraught area. Uh, and we think it might be helpful just to share our thoughts, where we got to in this process. And we're drawing um, I'm, uh, what I'm going to say is actually nothing really new. It's been said, I think, before in one way or another by various writers in the UK and in Europe, um, specifically people like Neve Moore, Jennifer Mason, and, and Janet Heaton have, have, have kind of talked through, that have come this journey before us, I think. Um, so in our own discussions, how do I get this? Well. Just the arrow button on the keyboard. All right. Oh, Oh, good, thank you. In our own discussions, we found it very helpful to disentangle two sets of historical, political, institutional considerations which we think have shaped debates and concerns around archiving, uh, sharing, and, and, and in the UK context. The first two refer to political, economic, and strategic framings of secondary qualitative analysis or data reuse. Um, both as a new methodological approach and as a government perspe governmental perspective. And I'm going to focus on these first of all. Why can't I do that? That's it. The first of these is the estab establishment of the UK Qualitative Data Archival Resources Centre. That's quite a mouthful. Or QualiData at the University of Essex in 1994. Um, 
The sociology department at the University of Essex is a, is, is a highly influential uh, department in the UK um, and is often seen as the leader of, of various new methodologies, etc. But also, it's, um, it's quite a political department and has been since the 1970s and 80s. Since 2012, this quality data um, has been absorbed into the UK data service. So it's made kind of, the, as, a, as, a, as an institution, it's made kind of several pr progressions, I guess, into the kind of heart of government from uh, a, a sociology department and quite an antagon antagonistic sociology department back in the 19, uh, late 1980s, early 1990s. And the second is the publication in 1996, this is the 2007 version of the ESRC. Uh, the Economic and Social Research Council is the main funder for social research in the UK, just to give you a kind of bit of context there. Uh, the ESRC data sets policy, which requests all those in receipt of ESRC funding to offer copies of their data for inclusion in QualiData, in this archive. And these two developments signal two things. First, it constituted an institutionalization and a bureaucratization of a process that arguably already existed. We need to bear in mind that this is within the context of a perceived move at the time in the 1990s on behalf of the ERC, ESRC to economize, monetize, and regulate the production of sociological knowledge, realigning it or aligning it with the imperatives of government and to some extent of industry and markets. So there was a lot of mistrust of the ESRC in the 1990s and early 2000s. And boy, there's more distrust now because they have moved ever more into that position. We, we cannot imagine what the ESRC is funding these days. Um, grim place, the UK. Um, Moreover, the UK is a home of a very impressive array of quantitative social science data sets and administrative data sets, and many of these are longitudinal. And the merits of archiving and secondary analysis of quantitative data had at this point been very well established. So the move to archive quality data was seen as a natural progression of this. So we see that the justifications for archiving qualitative data were seen at the time as very much top-down, a top-down requirement which was mainly seen as economic. We were told suddenly, before you apply for funding to produce any new qualitative data, check, check the archives that that quality data doesn't already exist. But modeling this development and the archiving of secondary analysis, or archiving and secondary analysis of quantitative data belied an implicit assumption of equivalence between quantitative and qualitative data. And this, in turn, implies a somewhat positivist approach to the whole question of the reuse of quality data. And understandably, this raised major concerns amongst those of us working in the qualitative paradigm, which of course tends to be more interpretive and reflexive. The secondary historical factor consisted in a strategic framing of qualitative secondary analysis or data sharing uh, by people like, by, like Janet Heaton, who's been very influential in the UK around defining this as a methodology. It's defined as a kind of new methodological approach around which a range of claims can be made and methodological and epistemological approaches can be elaborated. So debates have been sustained about the strengths and appropriate uses of this new, it's a new approach suddenly, it's, 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 it's a new methodological um, entity and the new types of analysis that we can identify. Now, in the shorter term, this kind of reframing or framing of this as a method um, gave a certain credibility and rigor to the notion of secondary, qualitative secondary analysis. And it also generated funding around this as a method. So it was a very strong and probably sensible strategic position to take. But um, what we also see is that this strategic framing phrase, there was, it was abundantly clear that this is the moment that the notion of reusing data became very fraught and fraught with debate and strong viewpoints about the pros and cons in terms of epistemological and ethical terms. And Slavnik, in 2013, very well summarized these debates and problems in terms of the strengths and weaknesses. You know, the strengths, it can reveal unexpected data from other places, earlier times, different contexts. You know, it can really help in the development of new conceptual frameworks and perspectives. It's efficient. Um, 
the, you know, it's ethically and economically beneficial. We're kind of using and using again and using again stuff that there's a lot of labor gone into the collection in the first place. And in terms of cautions, the need, to be, need for awareness of the context in which the data was produced. These things I've kind of covered already. Um, and then, of course, the big one is questions of ethics and consent. How do you ensure consent within these things? So I think that's why Catherine said earlier on that we tend to use the word data reuse. And we're quite careful about that because we don't want to make any grand claims necessarily for what we're doing. Uh, we want to suspend judgment on whether this is a new methodology or a new methodological approach. Um, and, yeah, and, and, and just to kind of frame what we're doing in the least complicated way possible. Um, and actually this relates to, I suppose, the second, uh, uh, my second point about a set of debates. The problem, I think, with framing this in terms of a new methodological approach and also um, moving from quantitative secondary analysis to qualitative secondary analysis is that it doesn't speak to our strengths and inventive, in inventiveness as qualitative researchers. We have a lot of antecedents for this kind of work lurking around in the sociological methodology. And it, this kind of forces us to forget about these antecedents. For example, in the UK we've got the Mass Observation Archive. This is the, an archive that results, um, it's basically an organization that was founded in 1937 by a group of people who aimed to create an anthropology of ourselves. Um, and they recruited teams of observers and a panel of volunteers to write to them, basically, a couple of times a year about their lives. Uh, this went on to the 1950s and was taken up again in the 1980s by a team at the University of Sussex who are still continuing it. The latest date for writing in your diaries will be, I think, May the 12th this year. So we'll hear a lot about Brexit and our election, I think. Um, now, this archive has been used for decades to carry out longitudinal qualitative research and construct our histories of the present. And these kind of approaches, alongside other pre-existing approaches, such as documentary analysis and oral history approaches, I think they offer a scope for thinking through the questions raised by secondary qualitative analysis or data reuse in more constructive ways recognizing that we actually have antecedents with, within our own field for using. Moreover, we need to consider the original motivations of those who were actually involved in setting up quality data. Uh, this is Paul Thompson, who recently retired uh, his chair at the University of Essex, and he actually was one of the founders of quality data. Um, and he held a very, very different vision of qualitative analysis than the one that we have seen, the one that has been fed back to us by the ESRC. He says, it's incredible, he is an oral history, he's trained as a social historian, moved into sociology. So he's, his methods are historical. It's incredible how many other researchers came to use it, at least his data. At least five times as many major publications came out of this as the original research team could have produced. This has been an enormous source of satisfaction to me as a researcher. I want to encourage anyone here who has not yet deposited that will give you great pleasure and pride in the longer run to have your work used in that way too. Um, so, I, you know, he started with a much more altruistic, much more collegiate uh, vision, I suppose, of data sharing, um, and you know, which was so far removed from the notion of check it doesn't exist first, reuse, repurpose, you know, um, make do and mend almost is what we get told. And of course, that tendency is made much, much worse in the era of auster austerity now. Um, we, you know, it's almost, it's actually quite difficult to get new qualitative research funded almost, unless you've kind of made sure that you're not going back over other data sets. Um, so in conclusion, we can discern two very different constructions of and visions for secondary qualitative analysis. And as a group, surprise, surprise, we tend to align with this latter construction of data sharing. However, in so doing, we're not saying that this area does not require very careful methodological and epistemological consideration and discussion. However, we do think that the question of the reuse of quality data calls to the fore really interesting questions about the strengths and flexibility of qualitative research approaches in terms of our capacity as qualitative workers to deal with context and ref reflexivity 
and to define ever new types of data encounters, to think through new types of data encounters. So to think reflexively about what my encounter is with your data. What does that mean? Um, and also to recognize that those kind of encounters are always co-constructions. They're meaning makings, they're not uncoverings, they're not discoveries. And it also requires us to think about the ways in which qualitative research approaches in the social sciences are linked to or informed by perhaps approaches that may be used in history or the humanities as well as, or in addition to, approaches that are used in the natural sciences and positivism. And I think this becomes very poignant, and I'm not surprised that a group of qualitative health researchers might find this quite challenging, because we tend to straddle these two worlds, and we tend to be forced to move much more into the natural sciences, perhaps, than we're comfortable with. Um, and we think that there's almost like a sequestering of secondary qualitative analysis by a kind of positivist agenda, but which, which we might try and resist by pulling it back a bit more into the historical. I'm going to hand over to Catherine, who I think is going to introduce some talk, okay. chat. Yes, yeah. We don't have time already. Um, OK, so uh, basically to kind of round off a little bit of what you might already be thinking of already, this is a slide completely poached um, directly from one that was shared by Barbara from the discussion here that happened two years ago. Uh, I wouldn't expect that everybody here was two years ago at the Minding Our Words talk. Um, but it was very, it was so interesting to me because um, basically when, when she shared this with me uh, from, from that whole slide set that was compiled by a range of people here at the center, um, what strikes me is that th these pros and cons listings just haven't changed in terms of what we're feeling and in terms of what we're uncovering in the methods literature itself. And one thing I wanted to point out while Peter was talking, we've got quite an extensive bibliography at the end. Um, so when we're dropping name dropping and stuff, um, you'll have access to that. And I think the slides are going to be made available. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so, you know, all the, I, I won't go through these in, in great detail. We'll have a chance to kind of discuss it, it through. But what crops up are some of the things that Peter's already talked about, about feeling that neo-positivist logics might be getting imposed, um, uh, you know, particular concerns about how, like you raised at the back, how could someone else actually do this when they're, you know, with my data when they're not me and, and they don't have a sense of the entire context. Um, and, uh, you know, how much anonymizing will you need to do? Do you have to scrap so much of it, uh, of, of what's actually rich in the data uh, in order to share it with somebody that it kind of strips it back too far? Um, and uh, might researchers start minding themselves differently because they're then concerned about what gets made of their work later? And I think there are some interesting questions coming out about actually, if we're talking about consent, are researchers consenting to reuse? Are all those field workers consenting to reuse because they're being re-examined? Lots of interesting questions there. Um, and uh, lots of challenges, not just for ethics committees, but for also the day-to-day -day of real ethics. Um, so, you know, and, and, and Peter's certainly covered a range of the, the you know, and, and, and this is not to do down the reality of s some of the benefits. And one of the reasons why we started to engage in this is that we can definitely see some benefit in going back through reuse. It's, it's just that um, uh, caution and care needs, uh, needs to be taken. Um, one of the questions that certainly come up for me as I started to um, think through all these questions more is because of these imperatives about deposit and because our National Archive is growing, what's happening to it? And this came up through a, a conversation, um, and I've just realized I've said Barbara and it's Brenda. Brenda. Sorry. Um, <laughs> as soon as I looked at your face, I could see it. <laughs> please, please, my, my apologies. Um, <laughs> Let's not go back to that. <laughs> um, so uh, this came up in our conversation between my, myself and Brenda on the phone. And helpfully, so I was able to write to the UK Data Archive in the last week, and they've sent me this paper that they've just written um, to say what's happening to this data. And uh, it's been fascinating to me. I won't go into you know, all the ins and outs of the paper. It is referenced at the end. Um, but basically, the vast majority of use is, is teaching and learning. The vast majority. So, you know, sort of um, w what you have is 
Uh, this big orange bar is learning, and this sort of pinky, purpley one is, so teachers are downloading the data, students are downloading the data, maybe because of an assignment that's given to practice doing various kinds of um, analytical methodologies. Um, I've started using some of this in my own teaching, really handy, that the, their website has some kind of set tasks for teaching, you know, so they're really kind of selling themselves as a teaching resource. 15% of the re reuse um, is for new research or for reuse um, as a research endeavor. That includes PhD students who are reusing as well as a host of others. Um, something that uh, certainly became apparent to me as re in terms of reading this paper, uh, which just spoke to me of my naivety uh, to a certain extent as well, is that of course there's a considerable small but considerable amount of commercial reuse of this data as well. So um, that doesn't show here, but it shows up in other parts of this paper. So this is worth thinking through. Of the, of the set that they were looking at, about 40% of the subset that they were able to track over this course of 12 years, about 40% of the archived data had never been reused at all yet. But archives are long-standing things, you know, they're not short-term things. So 60% of that archive data of those, those collections had been used, and this was how they had been used. But it's a fascinating paper, I definitely highly recommend it. Um, and and um, something that was interesting to me, because I was watching around the room in terms of reactions uh, at this uh, older slide that Peter put up about the ESRC policy on data reuse and the, and the requirements there. Um, I did a little bit of digging after our talk on the Shirk website to make it Canadian. <laughs> SSHRC is committed to the principle that the various forms of research data collected with public funds, and this is what comes up quite a lot, belong in the public domain. Shirk has adopted a policy to facilitate making data that has been collected with SSHRC funds to other available to other researchers. So, were you aware of this? I am aware of it, but I'm not aware that it actually functions like that in reality. Okay, <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. So this is what's interesting. And so the, what I had, I didn't, couldn't put it all up on so many slides, but what's interesting and definitely visiting the website is, is an interesting and, and, and a, a part of the discussion um, that we had earlier as well, that it's currently in process. There's discussions underway about how to make this a reality. Um, SHRC are in the process of reviewing and enhancing their data management requirements for agency-supported research. So it looks like this is still an ongoing project. Mm -hmm. There's definitely a statement of intent. Um, and so I just thought that that would be interesting to, to kind of um, bring forward into the discussion here a little bit. And so it's a good time now to break for a bit of discussion amongst you because you've been listening to us for some time. So I just wanted to ask you to talk with someone near you, groups of twos and threes, however you'd like to work it out. Um, and just for about five minutes, consider these discussion points as you chat. So what do you think are some of the key issues, not just necessarily the ones we presented to you arising in relation to reuse? Um, and is it already playing out here? How, you know, what's, what's your experience of that beam? So um, off you go. I will move on. We will come back to all of this. Um, uh, so what I want to be able to do is kind of situate what we've been talking about, you know, just in strict methodological terms and uh, think a little bit for a moment about the questions that took us to where we are in our research. Um, but I'm going to try and move through this quickly. Uh, but, th but this gives you our context, which I think is helpful, hopefully. Um, and so, but, you know, basically this just kind of is a representation of the shift. In 1996, you have an a HIV antiretrovirals um, being introduced that were complicated medicines, difficult to take, very hard on the body, not just one pill a day, like is often available now, but not everywhere, um, but lots of pills, liquids, things that needed to be refrigerated. So it was a complex mechanism for getting drugs into bodies. And at the same time, it, it, you know, it, it actually ultimately was a game changer for HIV because instead of HIV being a terminal illness, um, at that point, deaths from AIDS, as long as someone is able to take the medication over a sustained period of time and as long as their system can handle it, um, they are able to live. 
They may not live well. Mm -hmm. They may have to live with a whole range of side effects, really hard on the kidneys, um, really hard on the uh, cardiac system. And over time, the, the formulations of the drugs themselves have changed and adapted and tried to improve in order to overcome a lot of that. But what you have is a history of 20 years of people who've been taking these drugs for all or some of that 20 years who are carrying with them the side effects of having what you know started off as some very to toxic medications and before that they were taking even more toxic medications and a whole bunch of experimental stuff on top of it um, and so then through this time since 1996 you have these original medications being transformed into newer and newer and newer uses um, part of this has been experimentation, discovery, extrapolation from what might be behavior uh, biologically plausible. So what you start to see is the drug not simply being used to treat people who are HIV positive, but in di many different ways and in many different kinds of mechanisms preventing the HIV taking hold. First of all, um, in pregnant women, drugs being used at the point of labor or pre-labor or post-labor for breastfeeding mothers um, so that uh, they can uh, seek to prevent vertical transmission of HIV. And actually, I've just been reminded uh, quickly that I'm going to start changing my language on that so that we're talking about vertical transmission rather than mother-to-child transmission. Um, and then. Uh, HIV treatment becomes available as an emergency mechanism for anyone who may have been exposed to HIV sexually or before that occupationally um, if the drug is taken within 72 hours and actually as soon as possible after the potential exposure having active drug in the system can prevent HIV basically um, latching on and reproducing and, and becoming viable within the system. We're now moving towards a whole series of initiatives um, that have, are really transforming the way HIV prevention is understood and lived um, and, and um, imposed um, uh, in terms of making sure that people who may pr potentially be exposed to HIV in the future might take this drug prophylactically. Um, it, it's not the same mechanism, but almost like a woman would take a contraceptive pill on a daily basis. This would be, um, at, at this point, is the same kind of delivery mechanism, and they're looking at ever newer forms of delivery mechanisms similar to long-acting reversible contraception having implants of this drug in people. Um, and also, and I'm sure there's discussion and debate, and certainly enormous amount of debate in um, di the different nations of the United Kingdom at the moment about whether or not the health service will fund um, uh, PrEP delivered in that way. And an, and an enormous set of understandings and awarenesses around the technologies of, um, and this is quite crucial to the context that we're talking about, where a person is already HIV positive, if they're able to take the drug consistently, if they're able to avoid other sexually transmitted infections, there's a, a whole lot of ifs and caveats around this. Um, uh, basically what happens is the viral load, the level of HIV virus that is replicating um, in the system becomes enormously reduced to the point where actually that HIV can no longer be transmitted because the levels of virus in um, uh, blood and sexual fluids and breast milk are so reduced um, that it's possible to, co to be non-infectious if you are uh, successfully sustaining HIV treatment and it's working for you. So there's this enormous context of change and meaning and lived experience of HIV. Um, this is not a neutral trajectory, this is heavily politicized, this is not a global trajectory, I'm telling the story kind of from the UK perspective, this is unfolding in different ways in different places for all kinds of political and moral and ethical and economic reasons. Um, and it, can, is, oh, it is going to keep changing, but basically um, as social scientists working in HIV, we are noting that each new ARV adaptation combines with all other previous HIV adaptations to construct a very new set of futures and possibilities for people. Um, and a whole new range of expectations about what is possible. The HIV sector as a whole is completely shifting and shifting every day, it feels like, in terms of what we as social researchers are expected to prioritize in terms of our research um, and, and, and how we engage with 
uh, the clinic and and because so much of what HIV prevention consists of is clinical um, so much of our work has moved whole scale from community level work and community agency and ownership and um, approach to clinical um, ownership and approach and so we are asking in looking back to better understand what our historic data sets meant at different phases. What we're interested in and curious about is whether or not there is something to learn from these different eras and ages of engagements with, a, with antiretroviral medications for HIV, because what we know is that we're not just starting from nothing. In looking forward to these futures, we're starting from a very long history that goes back beyond 1996 as well. And so we um, have um, gained a small amount of funding from the Wellcome Trust to investigate these, some of these key research questions that situate us in this time of great change with a HIV treatments. And given the mixed outcomes um, that people have experienced with antiretrovirals as treatment, what we want to make sure is that some of these assumptions of the new era of HIV prevention possibilities can be interrogated. And we feel that looking back is probably a key part of that interrogation. But as Peter said at the beginning, as soon as you start to look back, things, everything gets messy. Um, and so we have a range of um, outputs associated with this small, this is just a small pilot piece of work that we've been able to get funded. It's enabled us to write a larger bid to the Wellcome Trust, which uh, we hopefully will have time to talk about later on, but I won't go into detail about now. Um, but basically what we were able to do with this, these funds is see what was possible from a, um, a large set of data sets that we were able to share across our network. Um, uh, talk to other people and explore more about the whole notion of data reuse um, and also to look at the feasibility and possibility of actually doing the archiving of some of our historic data sets. Um, so what we sought to do in this work was to develop a social science research agenda that could fully engage with that changing HIV landscape, but also to position us as social scientists in this changing world um, as, as critical friends, you know, get, bringing us back into the discussion as critical friends with researchers and policymakers and clinicians um, quite, quite, um, quite importantly. And so this is just a really speedy overview of um, the data sets that we ultimately are working with um, at the moment. And what I kind of wanted to clarify is that Peter and I were actually involved as PIs or researchers <coughs> on eight of the studies in this list. Um, along with a range of other colleagues because we come from a history of working with a collaborative research team. Um, two others uh, were actually led also by members of Sigma Research, the research team of which we were a part. So, so we're, it's, it's about a, a very small collection of people who've been working together within context over a long, num long number of time. And two further projects in the list, the HIV Support Project, which is a longitudinal study undertaken by Corinne Squire at the University of East London, and also um, HIV in the Biomedical, which is a, um, a qualitative narrative approach undertaken by uh, Ingrid Young and colleagues. She's now at the University of Edinburgh. So we also have work here that doesn't come from Sigma and doesn't come from Peter and I. Um, so these studies represent more than 550 participants, vast amounts of, of raw materials, um, and for this explanatory stage, basically what we were uh, looking to do was to just see what, what we had, what, we, what was possible to work with. And so what we did is we sampled just three transcripts from each. Some of these studies were interview-based um, studies, and some of them were focus groups, and some of them were a mix of both. Uh, Actually, technically, some of them were mixed methods, quants, and qual studies as well, but we were just looking at the qualitative components. Um, so that just gives you a sense of the scale. And now, looking in the literature of what people have done, I haven't seen anybody who's tried to do that. And I can't, I'm starting to understand why. Um, <laughs> so what we really wanted to cover with you today are some of the practicalities, kind of the real um, meat and potatoes of what we're talking about. And so 
to start off with, um, you know, we needed to establish as a team what our approach to data management was going to be. And so collectively as a network, and this is myself, Peter, Corinne, Ingrid, all the people who were involved as the original PIs, um, we generated our own um, data management plan for this study to talk about, you know, how we were going to be working with what we were holding and sharing. Um, that then quickly enabled us to engage with the processes of completing data sharing agreements. Now in our context, data sharing agreements are institution to institution speaking to each other um, uh, with checklists about how data management is going to be coordinated. What was interesting is some institutions had a whole infrastructure ready to go around having a data sharing agreement, others hadn't at all um, and, and really didn't even know what to do about the request. Um, and so in some cases we were showing the institutions what a data sharing agreement might look like and asking if they'd like to modify it. Um, and there is a whole set of tensions there, com coming back to this question of ownership. As, as principal investigators we tend to act like the data is ours. We kind of also know like in legal terms in most contexts or certainly in our context the data is not mine because I work for an organization the organization owns the data but we still act like we own the data um, and some of us when we move institutions we take it with us even though we have a data <laughs> management agreement that says it has to sit with the institution. Now some people would say it's more ethical to take it with you because who are you leaving it with in the institution and you know so all of that is is a part of what we're um, c considering as well. Um, and so we kind of need to be real about the fact that this is an enormous set of gray areas and policies and practice can sometimes radically diverge. Um, and certainly what I found in the process was that even though our institutions often had data sharing agreements, these were very much pitched around um, actually how I as a researcher would enable perhaps a master's student to share some of this data to use it as part of a learning process for their um, for their work um, but that uh, none of that data sharing in infrastructure connected to what archiving might look like at all um, and so there can be a, an institutional disconnect between what they're calling data sharing what, and if archiving isn't data sharing, I don't know what it is, but they're not imagining archiving within that. And so you, you, you have these various um, strains of reality happening. Um, and moving on to the point about anonymizing and the anonymizing procedures, and I've brought copies with me. We devised collectively um, a protocol for anonymizing the work um, uh, and the materials that we had before we engaged in any sharing of them. And we worked, it was a bit of a fraught process. We worked and reworked through that and then used our protocol for anonymization um, just with a subsample of three randomly selected pieces of um, material from each of the original studies to see if it worked, to tweak the protocol a little bit. And what we were looking for uh, was to um, afford flexibility in the process of anonymizing, that it wasn't possible to just slap an algorithm on or do a word search, you know, or just look for common names, because reliably anonymizing material means seeing it in context. So if an individual says to me, I was an HIV activist in 1980, and then I traveled to Australia for a while, and then I came back and I worked at the University of Greenwich, None of those individual pieces of data are necessarily identifying, but in combination you can put them together and look at, see a person. So the whole process of anonymizing for us is about reading the richness of what's in this material and saying our basic principle is to take out as little as possible, but we have to take out enough so that you can kind of remove the picture of the full person that could be triangulated from those bits of individual data that they might offer. So it's quite subjective. <laughs> it's human. It's a human task. It's quite a skilled task. It's going to be imperfect. Um, but it's not about word searching and just taking out the name of your boyfriend. Um, that's clear. Um, and, uh, you know, certainly in, it, we're still working through that process and, and cross-checking. So we've got a member of our team who's actually been a transcriber for a very long time, heavily involved in these projects, and, but we have to quality check the, the work he's able to do and, and, and make sure that we're all 
comfortable with that as we go along. Um, in terms of analysis, I'm just very aware of the time now. Um, in terms of analysis, we, uh, as I said, we, were, we, we each worked with three transcripts. And, and what Peter and I did is we took three transcripts from each of the study. We ended up with about 71 um, transcripts to work with. And so the two of us went through them and just pulled out material that was relevant to HIV treatments because we were just narrowing in on that. Not all those studies were about HIV treatments. Some, um, some of the transcripts hardly mentioned it at all. So we were looking for the absence of mention, the inclusion of mention, and chunking together and pulling together and basically coding just those elements that were about HIV treatment. Um, and then we took the, as we went through that process of familiarity and building familiarity, we took the emergent themes through to our colleagues um, in, a, in a writing day, in a, in a planning day, to kind of say, okay, these are the kind of 10,000 different areas that we are feeling all of this data going in and the, you know, these are the themes that are emergent. They were able to help us contextualize what we were seeing and, and, and reading um, and, and together collectively we refocused back on what do we think is achievable in the time that we have and what are the most salient questions emerging given the context that we're all working in now. So doing that data sharing workshop basically, which is a process written up by Anna Tarrant as well, um, that really helped to recenter our thinking. Um, and then at a later stage, um, Peter actually was able to take a closer thematic analysis, just really focusing in on a couple of time points. And, and really from the, from the vastness um, for this pilot work, we just focused in on some, some very narrow points. I'll move on to just discuss uh, some of the practicalities of archiving. So um, we're looking right now at depositing five of the Sigma research data sets to the UK Data Archive. And that's not just about assembling the raw materials, the, the, the material uh, transcripts that are anonymized, but also any metadata that can describe the project. So project descriptions, website pages that describe the project, papers and reports and community reports and briefings that come out of them, um, but also question routes and topic guides. And actually, I found in this process that it's in the rereading of the original question routes that you really get enormous insight into what were we or what were they after? What were they thinking? And then you also then start to critique the researcher as you're going through the transcript and yourself. You know, I'm looking at some of my own things saying, why didn't I follow that up? Um, why did I go so far off track? You know, so you're, you're also critiquing um, at the same time, but definitely having access to the topic guides has been key. Um, the UK Data Archive definitely make everything as hassle-free as possible. So they, you know, they don't get all wound up about formatting or procedural stuff. They're, they're, they're trying to suck it in. So they're making it as easy as humanly possible to deposit. Um, but also, we are now at a point where we haven't deposited yet. Um, we need to decide what, basically what licensing arrangements we're going to put on these materials. And that's going to be different for each principal investigator, um, for each study. And actually, there might even be, you know, some transcripts might just have to be left out entirely because they could be too identifying or different conditions could be attached to some transcripts. So not everything has to be um, treated as one. There, there, there's an enormous amount of flexibility about wh what, um, what needs to be attached to it. But we, we basically need to do some serious thinking about the language, the explicit language of the stewardship and the ownership of, of that work. And if, if it's me for a period of time and I have to do a vetting process before anybody can get access to that data, that's entirely possible. We can impose limits on this data w which are like the lesbian gay archive, which is you can only go into a locked room and you can't take any materials out. That, that, you know, or, or um, you know, you can only be, um, uh, you know, uh, a tenured member of a university. Like, you, you, we, can, we can put those conditions on. <coughs> So I'm going to stop now and... Yeah, I'm just going to talk about that for a minute. For a minute. Because I think we should talk about Yeah, we ourselves. need to talk amongst ourselves. Um, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm going to jettison what I was talking about and try and just, just really just summarize, I think, something. Of what I was going to talk about was emergent findings. And what I would looked at was kind of two points in the epidemic. Um, 
and and and, and thought those through, and we thought we found a lot of interesting stuff, um, which I can I can share with you at another time. But I think what what's what was most interesting is I think what Catherine has just touched on. A lot of these data sets were applied research. They were done at different times in the epidemic for very very different reasons. Um, uh, we, you know, and no matter how much we would like to represent them as kind of just purely speculative, looking at the experiences of people living with HIV or living around HIV, we were seeking meaning very clearly all the way through. So, for example, a lot of the work that I did was about gay men's sexual risk practices, making, se making sense of gay men's sexual lives. Um, and so, you know, we were at the time involved in all kinds of discussions about, you know, um, things like strategic positioning and, um, and, uh, and, and, and negotiated safety and condom use. What was very interesting was coming back to both my own and other transcripts, um, you know, between 10 and 20 years later, um, and seeing the extent to which we were meaning making at the time, and seeing these uh, transcripts um, I'm not going to say in an unmediated way, uh, because it's never unmediated. By reading it, I'm mediating it, but in a differently mediated way. Um, and that allowed um, different things to come through. Um, and certainly, you know, the, the kind of accounts that we were presenting at the recent CAHR conference uh, of experiences of taking HIV treatments or of avoiding HIV were um, actually probably very different to the kind of accounts that we highlighted or chose to highlight um, originally. So there's that. Um, but also I think that the main thing that we found in terms of our reflection was the extent to which we forgot. Uh, the extent to which we forgot even what we'd written in our analysis originally. Um, going, I sat, um, oh, I won't even go into it, but anyway, <laughs> dealing, dealing with the data from the, the mid-1990s was harrowing, really, really difficult. Um, and I was shocked to think that either I or colleagues, who I, who I know now, um, were sitting in a room covering this material in a very straightforward way. It's by no, it was straightforward at the time because that was the reality. It was by no means straightforward now, looking back. It was awful, actually, for, um, for some of that data, and some of it was great. But, um, so the extent to which we forget or forgot what, the, what, what we were saying back then, or what we were hearing back then, has been absolutely salutary. But what this allows us, I think, to do, as Catherine said, is to is to uh, yeah sorry and 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 and, and we can uh, you know I, w what's very clear is that there were things that were unknowable back then uh, that we know now and so you know my interpretive gaze now is making sense with huge benefit of hindsight and history so i guess what i'm trying to say is it became very very clear to me for what it's worth that when I was encountering this data again, these data again, or these, this raw material again, um, I wasn't the same person who's encountering this data again, mm -hmm. um, and I was not encountering it in the same way. To me, it was very clear that it was a very new or different type of encounter. And I, I think I'll kind of maybe just leave it there for what it's worth, because th we have findings and, and they are very different, but we'll publish them yeah. somewhere else. Do you want to just do that? Yeah. Because I think we should talk. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's my way in my pages. So, uh, where are we at? So, yeah, what, just as a kind of wrapping up, um, what we saw ourselves doing as this unfolded was kind of freeing ourselves up from just doing more prospective research sort of on the latest technology. What's the next question in HIV? Let's go forward and do it as if you're kind of always looking forward because that kind of research can be like, you know, training in and focusing in your binoculars on the next thing up there, but actually it makes you quite blinkered. It's quite hard, to, you know, you, you, you've cut out all your peripheral vision and the stuff that you know. Um, at the same time, we don't see this kind of research as just looking backward in the rear view mirror. That also restricts vision um, and you're kind of um, just tending toward one, one perspective. And you run the risk of missing out on what's ahead when you're always looking back. So the kind of model, oh, it's so dark. Um, the, this is an array of telescopes um, that can basically swivel. So it's about considering 
where our gaze is able to take us if we've got the ability to kind of swivel around, look backward, look forward, adjust focus in and out, make it blurry sometimes um, because that's what happens. But this is an approach which can enable us to look across time, across populations and across primary research questions. But by no means are we saying it's simple um, or straightforward, it raises all of those complexities that we spoke to. So as we promised, um, for those of you who want the slide set, we do have a really full range of references. And there's a couple of website pages that we've put up of examples of other projects and teams in the UK, it, from our context that we're familiar with, who are, are exploring uh, working across qualitative longitudinal studies. Um, and Timescapes is an ESRC funded um, qualitative longitudinal initiative and we wanted to make sure that we absolutely acknowledge um, our, our co-investigators in this work and we will stop there.